stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building. And our guests are actor John Fleck and violinist Etienne Gara. Los Angeles-based actor, performance artist John Fleck, who was born in Cleveland but moved around to dozens of schools, attended Cleveland University and the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. His work has garnered numerous awards and has been funded by the Getty, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the LA Cultural Affairs Department, among other places. He's performed in museums, he's been on stage at major theaters, and you've seen him uh, in films and on TV. And in fact, he's an actor who's been... Blacklisted. Blacklisted? No, I just thought you were waiting for me to say something. <laughs> he's an actor who's had so many roles on Star Trek. Oh, yes. Isn't that right? Yes. So what were those all? You're, you and what, two other people? I know there's only three of us, and I don't remember what they all were, but, uh, you know, I, I played about 16 different roles, and then the last one, um, I had a nice recurring role on Star Trek Enterprise playing Silic, the evil Sula band. So did you get into a lot of... Yeah, yeah, for about four years, that's all I did was makeup, heavy makeup makeup. And then I got cast in HBO's Carnival uh, for a season oh, playing the lizard man, playing Gecko. You're kidding. So, so I would have to be going back and forth, you know, between Santa Clarita and this makeup. And that Gecko, sometimes it would take six hours to get a makeup. So what do get they that up. do? They glue you. They, they, they take all this... Um, um, Latex. What, well, the, first they got to take all the oil off your body, you know? Because I had some full body makeup things. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they put me in a little diaper. And what do we see? Just... Well, you see, uh, just your you see eyes? the eyes. I mean, you know, it, it, you can tell it's me. You know, it's very thin, but they got to get all the oil. Then they start gluing these prosthetic pieces on you oh my to give a, a depth. And then they paint you. And then just like, you know, eight hours later, okay, you're ready to go. And then getting it off was crazy, but too. But then how long are you on the set? Oh, God. <laughs> well, they'd bring me in at four in the morning, you oh. know. And then they'd usually save me to the last shot of the day. So I would be there sometimes for mm, 16, 17 hours. Hot. Hot, and you can't really move, and you feel like you're being mummified. But, you know, I'll do anything for money, Joan. And you're in a diaper? I beg your pardon. Not yet. Just give me a couple more years. Is no, that uh, what they did? <laughs> Is that what they said? No. Well, I, they put, you, you know, wear... it's called a diata or something, some kind of Indian you kind of thing. You can't wear anything. Well, a lot of times they had me in regular clothes, but for the full body, you yeah. know, when I'm doing the freak show, they, had, they wanted to show all the lizard skin off, oh, you know? Oh, oh. So anyways, I'd be done with that, and then the next day I'd have to go into Star Trek, and they'd do like three, four hours of makeup there. So the only good thing about it is, Joan, I'm 94 years old. It was a great exfoliant. It makes me look so young, you know, because they take all the layers of skin off when they're removing it. The so. gecko one especially, right? Whoa. Oh, yeah, that's so, so good. Yeah, you look great for your age. Oh, I'm teasing you. But, but tell me what, what the difference is between an actor and a performance artist. Uh, I thought you knew. I thought you were a performance artist in your own fashion. Am I? Uh, I actually, it's yes. creative, isn't it, to ask you questions? Yes, it is creative <laughs> to ask questions. I decided. <laughs> and it's also creative to connect people. Yeah. I'm just learning I mean, this these is a new performance things. art as well, <laughs> you know, right. if you want to look at it like that. Actually, What's the difference? Well, performance art, I get to create my stuff. I get to write it. Um, and, you know, whereas being an actor, you're interpreting other people's lines. And, uh, Performance art, you know, I... God, what is performance art? Joan? I don't know. Jeez, you know, um, I started out, you know, I went to acting school and then I couldn't get a job, so I just started performing in bars, you know. I but had what a, did you perform? Well, I had a four-octave voice, which I still have an incredibly, uh, you know, I can sing really high and sing really low. So you sing? Yeah, so I would get on top of bars and I would sing arias, and these, this was in the punk rock oh. days, so... 
So basically, I'd get up there, and you know, and most of the time, you know, I do stuff in the nude as well. So that makes it performance art as well. You know, it was the '80s after all. That everything. was very performance art, yes. wasn't it? Yes. Well, that's the only way to it? get their attention. You know. But what do you do? You just come out and do a solo something? Well, the first show I ever did. I mean, obviously, my shows have evolved. You know, in fact, I just did a thing at Red Cat uh, where I, I have a new show called Blacktop Highway. It's a gothic horror screenplay that I act out all the roles and Let's stuff. Let's talk about Red Cat. Okay. It's Let's Downtown. Talk about okay. It's downtown underneath Disney, and it's, it was part of CalArts. I don't know if they're still connected. Well, actually, it stands for uh, Red Cat. Yes. It's Roy and Edna, Disney something. Edna. Cat. Roy, Cal Edna, <laughs> CalArts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all in there, Red Cat. Right. So what did you do there? It's a black box, right? Yeah, it's a big black box, about 250 seats, and they have a new works festival. And I, this is my second one I've done in the last six years. Um. And uh you know, they give you a little money, and I got a little grant money, and I got a team together, and we created a show, and it's really, really good, you know? But what was it? What did well, you it's do? Well, it's a, I say it's a gothic horror screenplay on one man's body, and I kind of do, I narrate the screenplay, and I act out all the parts, and I do all the lighting You're myself. You're only person on stage? I'm the only person. And then we videotape. You know, they have a lot of video stuff there. Uh -huh. So, so uh, you know, they have a big screen, then they have these monitors, so I interact with, you know, me as other characters, and uh, and it's a horror. Oh, uh, you do? So, yeah. Do you build a stage, or are you just down It's flat? a simple stage, you know, and I, I use wigs and, and stuff, but it's all very simple, and, uh, and, you know, I just literally read it like a screen play, you know, so, exterior, night. So does Red Cat sponsor that in a way or they well, sure. present it is they that present it? it part of the now fest and uh yeah um, new works, new works. Yeah. yeah yeah and they give you a little money so it's good so can you take that somewhere else well that's what i'm hoping we videotaped the heck out of it and now we're editing it and uh, i would like to tour it around the country and do it in some spaces like red cat and are there a lot of spaces like Red Cat? Well, you, there's not a lot, but you know, you have every city has, and not usually, you know, like the Walker Center. Yes. And, uh, but are they always connected with museums or schools? Well, a lot of schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I recently started the school circuit, and I like that. Yeah, universities. So, you collaborate with actors and musicians when you do a. Well, performance. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had a musician. Uh, we wrote some of the music, and then uh, and then we videotape it. So I work with a videographer. Oh, so you do. So you. Yeah. So it's a big collaboration, right, really. Right. Most of my shows tend to be pretty simple. This was a much more complex show. So, yeah. so how do you get from performance art this? to acting, to be on stage, or to be... Well, you know, one of the things you forgot to, to say about the funding was... <laughs> <laughs> I haven't forgotten anything oh, yeah, yet. Yeah. I'm getting to it. People thought it was spontaneous <laughs> what she was saying about me, but she was actually reading it. No, but, um, uh, you know, I you forgot. said funding, national endowment for the arts is what kind of put me on the map, because they, I, I, I was given a grant by the National Endowment in 1990, and then they rescinded the grants. So we became known as the NEA-4. We went to the Supreme Court. We sued the National Endowment for the Arts. We went to the Supreme Court because they denied our funding because Senator Jesse Helms at the time thought our work was too um, sexual and too uh, controversial and, and anti-religious. So, uh, so he said that funding should not be given, you know, on morality clauses. And we said you cannot, you know, say oh. you cannot. How do you art art? How do you say what is morally art? You know, we're anyways. Um, uh, so we sued. We went to the Supreme Court. We won our case. You know. So that's the reason I didn't say NEA. I didn't forget. Oh, it you done. were going to bring it up later. <laughs> I was, was going to bring it up. Oh, I blew it for you. I was going to bring it up because I was the NEA now funds you. After well, this glitch, I right? I know, yeah. Now we can get now all of a sudden, my <laughs> old doddering age, they're not afraid of me anymore. But but, but it was a glitch, wasn't it? Uh, in, a gl a glitch in, in your in work. One. Well, yeah, but in a way, I, the segue being that how did I start getting acting work? You right. know, I'd always been an actor, and it's funny, all of a sudden, all the press started coming out ah, about the NEA. From that? From that. And then I remember Stephen Bochco brought me in for a, a series, and... Uh, you know, I used to go after the NEA thing. The thing that got me in trouble was I urinated on stage while reading a Bible. Anyway, it's all out of context. Oh, that was like the artist then. Piss uh, Christ. Pi well, it was all during that son same time with Serrano and yeah, stuff. Yeah, was yeah. it? We were all using body, you know. Fluids. Well, fluids, I mean, you know. <laughs> fluids. Some, some more so than others. Oh, and so that's when the NEA. Right, right. Had, had they funded you and then rescinded it? Yeah, yes. there were four of us they funded. Me, Karen Finley, Tim Miller, and Holly Hughes. So they, and Karen they, Finley? 
Finley too, this yeah, dancer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not a the dancer. She's she's a performance artist. Oh, she's yeah, a, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And um, so, anyways, I started. You know, I was always auditioning <laughs> for stuff, and then you know, I'd go into casting people, and they go, "Oh no, don't go peeing on the furniture." But it's funny, I started. But they hired you. They, I started working because any press is good press, I guess, in Hollywood. I think so too. <laughs> and so you, you we really need a scandal, you and me. <laughs> no, no <Okay>. scandal, <laughs> no press. scandal. So, so um, you perform in museums. I perform in museums and so you were at the and, ICA in yes. Boston and London. What yes. would you do that? What would you do there? Well, I did a show called "Blessed Are Little Fishes," which is the show that got me in trouble with the NEA. It was oh. all about uh, alcoholism and religion and in my family. And uh, was that at the uh, ICA? Yes, show? yes, we did the ICA Boston and in London. We we didn't do that in London, but but, uh, but you do, did do the ICA, which is Contemporary Arts, right. and they and. You just do it in an auditorium because most of those places do not have a stage. Well, it, you know, once again, it was like a black box, you know. Oh, and it was. Yeah, uh, I forget. God, it was so long ago. That was like 20, 20 well, what, 1990. That's when was not that? very f long ago. That was 25 years ago, honey. No, this friend of mine worked at the Times for 25 years. He just got a gold watch. Oh, and really? I had worked with him at the Herald, and I went 25 years ago. That's a just went like that. You sure do. <laughs> but tell me. You've been on the stage at the Kirk Douglas, at the Old Globe, and those are just regular acting gigs, right? Right. These are, you know, where you audition and then you're cast. And, um, yeah, you know, I just had an audition yesterday for some TV thing. So, yeah, I'm still doing it, you know. And when you do TV, do you audition for certain kinds of things? Uh, yeah, well, thank God I'm not auditioning for freaks anymore, you know. Um, I, I made a, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Star Trek kind but of But they, they must keep calling you back for that, though. Well, Star Trek isn't around anymore. I mean, that was a little But I mean, that trend. kind of... Yeah, no, I haven't been called in for that kind of creature in a while. But, you know, they love to typecast you, as you know. Like, when I, my first series was Murder One, where I played a gay secretary. For about ten years <laughs> after that, all I went out on were gay roles, you know? And you were beating everyone at them, right? Well, I, not all the time, but, uh, you know. And then I started doing the freak role, so I made a joke how, like, all I do is play freaks and... Uh, queers. But, but <laughs> jokes, but jokes, I mean, jokes, ghosts. Ghosts. Ghosts? Have you ever done any of those kind of horror films? Ah, uh, I'm sweating. I'm working. I, I'm, I have so much energy. I sweat. Uh, I have never done anything like ghosts. What have I done? Horror I films would be good for you. Know, you. I keep thinking. Look at my face. I'd be great for a horror movie. <laughs> but they can make you up. That's what I meant. When you get into that kind of a right, right, right. Okay, you heard it here. He's going to be on horror films from now on. <laughs> exactly. What do we have in the hamper right now? What are you going to do? The hamper. The, you mean today? <laughs> tomorrow? No, oh, tomorrow. The next day? <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing the script. I, I'm, you, well, you know, I, the script's written, but really honing the script and uh, editing the video to start sending off to people for this blacktop highway. You know, and uh, audition for this great part yesterday, you know, but it's a crazy life. You know, you audition, you work so hard on it, you got to let it go. But that'd be nice if it happened. Do we have anything else? About what? In the hamper. In the hamper. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to New York for a month, you know, to see what I can cook okay. up there. And uh, Other than the hamper, just dealing with my <laughs> house here. You're not going to let me forget that word, are you? It's a great word. Why don't you use it? Hamper. Okay. Hamper. John. Boy, did 15 minutes fly by like that? Thank you. We'll be right back with violinist Etienne Gara. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum on Highland Avenue in the heart of Hollywood. And our guest is violinist Etienne Gara, who was born and raised in Paris studied at the Mozartian University in Salzburg, and was a scholarship uh, winner to the university in Cologne. And he went to music school in Indiana, was it? In Indiana, in Bloomington, Indiana. In Bloomington, <laughs> Indiana. He earned his master's at the New England Conservatory of Music. And now you're at SC? or you were at SC, or you have been at SC? Uh, a little bit everything, actually. <laughs> All of that? I started at USC with, in the studio of Midori, 
uh, Goto there, uh, fantastic Midori, violinist. The famous, violinist. A famous, wonderful violinist. How old is she? She's young, isn't she? She's in her early 40s. Oh, she is. So yeah. Has she been there a long time? Uh, quite a few years, yeah. Oh, I didn't already. realize that. And so how many students does she have? Uh, not many. I would say around eight at the moment. And so does she choose them? Do you audition to be? Yes. Uh, it's a long story. It's, uh, I was about to go back to Europe, actually, after my master's at NEC in Boston. And I met her at a music festival in Sweden. Oh. And uh, it was like love at first sight. I absolutely wanted to continue uh, studying with her. Was she playing then? or did She you was just playing, and we had a few lessons with her, and it was absolutely wonderful. Like master classes? Yes. Yes. And uh, after thinking a little bit, not too much, because <laughs> it was such an opportunity, you know, to be able to come to California and study with her, I decided not to go back to Europe. And oh, so come you did. Here. And so you came here, and then did you have to audition? I had to audition at USC. Uh, great moment of stress, as every audition is. And what do you do? How do you audition for something like that? This would be your master's, right? Or a certificate? It's or? a graduate certificate in performance, in violin performance. It's called. Oh. I already have my master in Boston. I see, right. So uh, it's like a normal university. You know, you apply uh, by uh, beginning of December, or a lot of paperwork to, to do. And then you have a, a live audition where you play in front of a committee, uh, teachers of the school that you apply two and that was in March, early March. So how many people would you play in front of, five or six? Um, I would say normally it's like between five and ten. And do you pick out what you want to play? You have a required program. Oh, that it's you have like skating, to, right? It's like, a, yes. like going <laughs> to, to get so many points? Um, I don't think they give points for like auditioning, uh, applying for a school, but they decide whether they feel you have the level of the school and whether the teacher is interested in working with you. Oh, so they have to like you too. They want yes. you f to see how you perform. Exactly. So they tell you how, for example, to play a piece from Bach, a concerto, a sonata, a virtuosic piece, and then you can choose whatever you want in those categories. Oh, they and tell you, you what to prepare for, and then yes. you... And then you have to be accepted by the school first, and then the teacher, once the school approved, uh, you will save yes or no they want to teach you. For Do you play on a certain violin? I play a certain violin. It's a copy of uh, Stradivarius made by it's a German maker who lives in Paris, a wonderful person uh, called Stéphane von Baer. He actually won uh, the VSA competition last year, which is an international competition for violin makers. And how many violins does he make? A lot? He makes quite a few. He's also very famous for his violas. Ah. So most of uh, principal players in, in big uh, European orchestras, a lot of uh, Vienna Philharmonic players play his instruments and soloists. And so does he take orders or does he have? Yes. Oh, he takes orders. So I he was knew what he was going to make for you? Yes, I was looking for, for instruments for quite a few years. And then uh, I went to Paris. I went to his shop, tried a couple of violins of his. And I was like, I, I want your violin. It's perfect? It was wonderful. Uh, we ha he had a great understanding of what I was looking for. So I immediately asked him to make a violin. It took one year before I actually got the violin. And why does it take so long? Because a lot of people want his violin, and oh. he can make only that many. <laughs> I see. But he had to spend a year making it. You just uh, no. have to wait in it's line. It's a few months <laughs> to yeah. make a violin. And, yeah. and, and does he use certain wood? Is that, what did you want? What did you tell him you wanted? I wanted, uh, of course, a powerful instrument that you need, powerful. you know, that's always a need uh, nowadays. But I wanted a violin that has a, a very warm tone. I wanted uh, an instrument with uh, colors uh, that you can really search for the quality of the, of the sound. And very often, I have to say, um, modern instruments are getting better and better every day, actually. So they don't have to be handmade or they do have to be? They are handmade. They are all They are handmade. completely handmade. And uh, his instrument had just this particular sound and, and quality, uh, finesse that I liked. And what is it? Is it the wood that he uses or the... It's a lot of things. It's the wood, the varnish is very important. Varnish, The, the yeah. craftsmanship, the, the attention mm. to details. The way he cuts it would make a difference? Uh, the way he shapes it. Yes. yes. So that's why I was saying it's a Stradivarius copy, uh -huh. because it was made um, copying uh, Stradivarius from 1714, which is like the golden 
period of, of the maker. And that had a certain sound at that time? That's a certain sound, a certain way of playing uh, that is very uh, special. You can recognize it you, you as can. a violinist between, for example, a Guarnerius uh, oh. del Gesù that is a, a very, I would say, masculine violin. You can really dig in it and, and get the best sound of it by not fighting but really going to the core of the instrument, where Stradivarius has a little uh, of a feminine finesse, I oh, think. Oh, it does. Is, yes. this, th is there another kind that people use? Um, what does Medora use? Uh, she has a Guarnerius. So it's more stronger? It's, it's a different type of sound. I, I would personally say I, I think it's more masculine. That's what I mean, like yeah. that's what you're saying? So maybe um, a woman wants to have something that's tougher. Yeah, it has this robustness to it but, uh -huh. in the playing. And, uh, but great violins played both instruments. Sometimes they had both at home. Oh, they did? they were lucky, and they could choose, uh, depending on the program that they were oh, playing. Oh, I was going to say, does the music ha make a difference, too? Yes, it can. And they can have their preference, you know, like... Uh, Do you come from a family of musicians? Yes and no, because my father was a singer in his oh. youth. And then he stopped for different reasons, and he, he was Hungarian, he's still Hungarian, <laughs> and uh, emigrated to France where he met my mom. And is she a musician? She is not a musician. And then he became uh, a music agent, so an impresario, and then a uh, music director oh, in a really? theater in Paris, and he has uh, also a festival, a uh, chamber music What festival. is it called? The, the festival. The festival is called Juventus. Juventus. It's a festival for young European artists. Oh, did you plan it when you I were young? I played there, yes. Did you? Well, when did you start? You were very young. I was around five years old. And why did you start with the violin? Well, my parents say that uh, my father brought me to the theater where he works, and I was uh, listening to a general rehearsal, a dress rehearsal of Violins Gidon Kramer a very famous uh, Russian violinist, and I just wanted to do like he was doing. <laughs> and then I, I went on my parents' nerve until they just <laughs> finally uh, got, I, I, yeah, got me to the school. I remember it was like on Wednesday evenings at the school where I was going, and I survived there one year. And when they saw that after one year of that uh, after-school program, I still wanted to play the violin, oh, you're still <laughs> they actually... Uh, contacted the conservatory. I mean, it's a bit a different system in France. You have conservatories, which is only for music education, oh. but you can start very young. So it's not like here, like and university Which you started level. at, right? So I started like six, six and a half in the conservatory there and never stopped until That's fantastic. last year. That's fantastic. D did you use a smaller violin or yes. just, you do, they do? I had like an eighth of a violin. Is that just right? Very small. And then I had a quarter size, a half size that I remember liking a lot. It's three quarter size, and finally. <laughs> and finally, so quite how a few old violins. were you when you were regular size then? Oh, that's hard to remember exactly. I guess I was around twelve, maybe. Just, just almost a teenager. Yeah, eleven. When, when you went to so many different schools, you went in Cologne, you went in Salzburg. Do they teach different styles at those places? Yes, this. Or did you go a for a specific? Bit. Did you go for I specific? was always going for the teacher. That's what I was yes. wondering. More than for the school itself, actually, because the bond between the students and the teacher is actually what does everything. Uh -huh. And who were those teachers that you liked, San Salzburg? So, in Salzburg, I started with Igor Rosim, he's a Slovenian uh, violinist. And then I also stayed two years with uh, Helmut Setmeyer, who is a father, if you know, of Thomas Setmeyer, who is a very famous performer. Setmeyer. So did they have different styles? Uh, somewhat different, yeah. Um, I remember Igor Ozim was very specific about technique. He had a very oh, specific way of teaching the technique of the violin and, and the way of approaching the score and, and different uh, composers. Where uh, Helmut Setmeyer had a somewhat, I would say, more artistic, more fluid way of approaching and then things. How do you put them all together? How do you put those together to make your own style? Oh, it or can if be you difficult. have your own style, do you have your own style? I think I have my own <laughs> style very much, and uh, I'm digging in this like research of finding really your voice and, and continuing on that path. So the different experiences, say from Germany to Indiana, here you are, come to the United States. Did you come for somebody 
in particular? Yes. I came from uh, Mauricio Fuchs. Uh, I knew I wanted to come to America because it's somewhat of a parallel world, musical world, uh, to, to the European music world, and I just heard so much about it. And I was asking around, do you know a good violin teacher? I didn't know much about it, and I heard many times his name coming in the um, conversation, so I contacted him and asked if I could meet him somewhere, and I was lucky he had a master class in France. Oh, is that right? So I just went there. It was fantastic, and the next year I started with uh -huh. him. What should the audience look for when they're listening to a violin solo? I think they should uh, just see if they're touched by the way the violin is or the musician communicates the music. Speaks to yes. you. Um, it can be very personal, very subjective. Uh, fantastic violinists can touch more this person or that person. There's no rules. In different ways. Do you get something from the audience when you're playing? Oh, yes. Yes? Oh, very much. And how, That's what, the magic of the performance, yes. It's magic? Oh, Is it yes. always good? <laughs> <laughs> it's not always good, but when it's good, it can be really fantastic. How do you feel that? There is a response, an, a response, an attention uh, that you can feel. It can be in the silence that you feel they are so connected to every little gesture, you every can little feel sound. It? You can feel that, that tension, that electric tension with the audience, or you can have a very different approach, fantastic, to where the audience would actually almost participate. You feel like the body gesture when you move, they kind of are into really? the music. There are many different ways that uh, you can feel the public, but that's very a great public is very important for a concert. Yeah. That's really interesting. It so th that's all solo. You only do solo work? Solo or chamber music. So what we call solo is very often with a pianist. Uh -huh. So it's a duo. It's almost like chamber music. Right. Is the word. And chamber music is? We call it, I mean, it can be also sonata, which is violin, piano, but very often we define chamber music more as trio, so three people oh, and more, up to maybe, I would say, eight people. Before we leave, I, want, I wanted to touch on, uh, you've had some great episodes with Eric Tongi and Itzhak Perlman, and we have to mention the Armenian violinist, Kim Kashkarian. The violist, yes. Oh, she's a violist. She's a fantastic violist. She's uh, teaching at NEC in Boston. Have you played with her? I didn't play with her. I played for her. Oh, you did? And we had like chamber music. Uh, coaching with her was absolutely fantastic. And as many of the teachers I've met, uh, other violists, Roger Tapping, uh, my my teacher at NEC, uh, Donald Weilerstein, many others. It's hard to put all the names, it was so inspiring to meet them. Well, that's why today was so great, because we had so many names. And I think that's really interesting to open up the mm -hmm. world and hear all those names for just for a violin student. Yes, it, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's fantastic violinist uh, musicians, but also dancers. I just uh, collaborated last year with American Contemporary Ballet, which is based in oh, Los yes. Angeles. Yes, yes, I know. It was that. an amazing experience. Um, oh, did you play with them? I played, played with them. Uh, it was live uh, playing, and they were dancing. And Martin Chalafor plays with them too. Yes, exactly. Yes. So that's great, and I thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you. Etienne Gara and my audience keep writing to J A Q U I N N one at AOL.com. See you next time. Mm -hmm.